say they're going to be five rate cuts or four rate. They're running out of meetings. Right? There aren't that many meetings left <laughs> to, do, to do all the uh, all the cuts that that they're expecting. Um, and cutting rates became known as the pivot. You know, Wall Street, everything's a, it's a bit of jargon. So this is the famous pivot. Well, the Wall Street experts, I'll put that in quotation marks, started talking about the pivot in the summer of 2022. They've been wrong for two years. Now, you just guaranteed every deposit in the banking system, and you just said every bond is worth par, no matter how far underwater it is. You're out of tricks. Like, you have no more rabbits. Once you, once you guarantee every government bond in the system and every deposit in the system, there are no more rabbits in the hat. I'm Shay Russell, and welcome back to Cocktails and Commodities, the resource podcast where macro analysis meets mining insights. You know what to do, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Tap the like button so you get to hear more of me in your feed, and you never miss out on which exciting guest I'm going to bring on next. Please remember, of course, that all information in this podcast is general in nature and not financial advice. Today, we're doing something a little different. Today's guest is most sought after for his expert opinions on economics and geopolitics. And I've had the absolute pleasure of interviewing this person more than 20 times all around the world. But he's also a friend to me and my absolute nemesis when it comes to a pool game. Without further ado, allow me to introduce Jim Rickards, Editor of Strategic Intelligence. Jim, how are you? I'm doing great, Shay. How are you? Good, thank you. Look, it's great to have you on. It's been a long time between conversations for you and I. Uh, I think the last time we spoke was in Boca Raton in July last year. I think that's right, but we've done so many interviews over the years that it's hard to uh, keep track. We've also done them all over the world. I think, you know, obviously uh, uh, Melbourne and uh, uh, Sydney, New York, London. So, we, yeah, we've been – oh, uh, Berlin. I forgot Berlin. So we did one oh, there. Berlin, also. yeah. I think we've done interviews together on like three or four different continents now. Like we have an impressive track record. <laughs> Just uh, That's exactly right. So, uh, Jim, you and I are no stranger to our uh, virtual and in-person catch-ups. Uh, but today I want to sort of uh, talk about some of the US-centric uh, topics that are happening right now for an Australian audience. Uh, and simply put, because without the mothership of all central banks, the Federal Reserve, uh, we, we don't really have clear indications of what policy is going to happen elsewhere. Now, I know you are well-versed in these and you're well-known for your economic opinions and your economic strategy on this. But first thing I want to kick off today is the Fed. Now, look, I don't know about you. I've got Fed fatigue. I am so sick of seeing the Fed in the headlines. Uh, and there's a lot of people, you know, really getting ahead of themselves when it comes to what the Fed may or may not do this year. We've seen some wild miscalculations coming from the markets. I think, you know, in December last year when gold went for a run, some people were saying the Fed was going to cut five times this year, which seemed a little bit like fantasy land to me. Uh, right. Now we're coming up to the March Fed meeting, which happens on the 19th. Uh, 19th of March, uh, and some people are saying that there's going to be three Fed cuts this year. Jim, I want your opinion on this because as far as I'm concerned, you're, you're, you're a source of truth on this matter. What can we expect from the Fed this year? And my follow-up to this question is why does there continue to be such a disconnect between what the Fed will do and what markets are telling us? Well, uh, the, the, let me take the second part first because – they're, it's like a countdown, you know, five, four, three, two, one. All the people say they're going to be five rate cuts or four rate. They're running out of meetings. Right? There aren't that many meetings left <laughs> to, do, to do all the uh, all the cuts that that they're expecting. Um, first of all, this whole idea of the Fed rate cut. Now remember, it was March twenty twenty two. Rates were zero. When we say rates, let's be clear. This is the policy rate, the Fed funds target rate, also known as the policy rate. It's the rate that the Fed sets as a target and then they struck the open market desk at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York to conduct, you know, open market operations to target that rate. We're not talking about two year notes, five year notes, ten year notes. Those are all different. The very interesting, by the way, to look at the yield curve because we've had uh, almost a year and a half at this point of a steeply inverted yield curve, which is which happens, but it's unusual and it's a very powerful predictor of recession. So, you know, be careful what you wish for. Uh, in that sense. But so when we say rates, so we're talking about this very short term, really overnight Fed funds target rate. Um, in March 2022, it was zero uh, coming, you know, post pandemic, post COVID, et cetera. The Fed then began a classic a rate hike or monetary tightening cycle uh, on two fronts, one raising rates, but they also started to reduce the balance sheet. And I still run into people that go, oh, 
oh, the Fed is printing all this money. They're not printing money. They haven't been printing money for years. They've been burning money. They've been reducing the money supply. If the Fed has a five-year note, five-year treasury note that they bought five years ago, guess what happens? The treasury gives them their money back. They, they, they get paid. Well, if you take the money and buy a new five-year note, you're going to keep your balance sheet the same. You, it's a rollover. You, you take the money on the old one, you buy a new one. But what if you don't do anything? You take the money and you don't do anything. That money disappears. It's the exact opposite of money printing, where the money comes out of thin air. When you are reducing your balance sheet, the money actually disappears. So number one, the Fed's been reducing the balance sheet, tightening the money supply. But number two, what your, your point, Shay, is they've been raising interest rates. So they got all the way up to, from zero, they got to five and a half percent. Now, that's not the highest rate of all time the, that you'd, I would, you'd have to go back to uh, 1982. Paul Volcker was about 20 percent. I think the I think during the U.S. Civil War, uh, 140 years ago, give or take, uh, maybe a little more at this point, uh, maybe 170 years ago, it was um, uh, around 20 percent. But uh, so it's only five and a half percent. But it was the quickest five and a half percent ever. You know, from zero to five and a half. In about a year and a half, that was ex an extremely rapid set of increases. So the question was, when would the Fed stop, and then when would they cut? And cutting rates became known as the pivot. You know, Wall Street, everything's a, it's a bit of jargon. So this is the famous pivot. Well, the Wall Street experts, I'll put that in quotation marks, started talking about the pivot in the summer of 2022. They've been wrong for two years. Now, nobody said, oh, they're going to cut rates in the summer of 2022. Nobody thought that, but they started to say, well, they're going to raise them a little bit more and then they're going to pause, then they're going to cut them. And by early 2023, we'll have the pivot. Um, and the pivot has uh, is a narrative. And the narrative goes by a couple of different names. One is the soft landing. I'm sure you've heard of that. Uh, it's for your viewers, I'll uh, uh, inform them. There's no such thing as a soft landing. You, you have a hard landing, crash, recession happens. We may be ha that may be happening right now, but there, there is no such thing as a soft landing. So you can dismiss that one. The other one is Goldilocks. Uh, you know, the, we all know the nursery uh, story, um, not too cold, not too hot, but just right. The Fed would get it just right, uh, raise enough to cool inflation down, but not enough to cause recession. So they get it just right. So whether it was Goldilocks, um, the soft landing or the pivot, these are three names for the same narrative, which is, hey, the Fed's going to cut any minute now. You know, you start the countdown and buy stocks. So always, Wall Street always ends the analysis with buy stocks. Everything I just said, everything I just said is nonsense. Everything I just said is true. That is the Wall Street narrative. That is what you see in the in the uh, headlines and and newspaper articles, etc. But none of it is true. The Fed is nowhere close to cutting rates. Uh, the pivot crowd have been wrong for almost two years. I mean, how, how long do you have to be wrong before somebody says, you know, maybe you actually aren't thinking about this the right way? You're certainly, and what I do is um, I, you know, we all have our own opinions, but, you know, it has to be somewhat rooted in reality. You, if you want, if you want to be a good Fed analyst, which is what I, one of the things I do, you have to put yourself in the shoes of the Fed. You can't just pull a narrative out of thin air. You can't make up a story. You can't tell your investors, your clients, something that, makes them want to do what you want them to do. You actually have to say, I'm Jay Powell, or I'm, well, Jay Powell is pretty much the, the, the last word on this. And look at it from his perspective. And I, I dealt with Jay Powell, you know, you know, back in the day. Nice, smart guy, nice guy. Interesting thing about Jay Powell, he's a lawyer. He's not an economist. He's a lawyer. So I happen, I'm an economist, but I happen to be a lawyer too. So I can, you know, when you go to law school, you don't really learn the law. You just get brainwashed uh, in, a, in a good hopefully a good way. So I can think like a lawyer, as the expression goes. So you have to think think a little bit like Jay Powell. Now, what is his greatest fear? Uh, his greatest fear is that inflation gets out of control, which it almost was in 2023 and 2022. You go back to um, uh, late 2022 when inflation took off. And of course, it's, it's you know, the word was transitory, 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 transitory. Well, it, it wasn't really transitory. It's still here. Um, it, it peaked in uh, June 2022 at 9.1%. Uh, it it's come down a lot. Uh, it's around, it's in the, in the low three. So 3.1, 3.2, 3.3%. 3 
But here's what happened. It got stuck. It was uh, so when it went from nine to eight to five to three, everyone said, oh, the Fed's got this. They've got inflation under control, et cetera. But remember, their target is two. And you say, well, three, two, eh, it seems like they're close. Well, close isn't good enough if your target is two. And by the way, 3% inflation cuts the value of the dollar in half in uh, 18 years. Uh, so from birth to going off to college, your dollar's worth half. And by the time you get mid-career, you're 36 years old, half again. So 3% inflation is not benign. It actually really um, – uh, it takes a uh, it takes a whack at um, sorry I said eighteen years I meant to say twenty two years but the the point's the same in a rel- relatively short period of time from birth to mid career your your dollars lost seventy five percent of its value with three percent inflation sorry so the Fed's trying to get to do but the problem is that it, inflation was three percent right now just to be clear when I say inflation I'm talking about headline CPI consumer price index headline inflation three percent. And immediately, you know, the Wall Street crowd will jump up out of the seats. Oh, Jim, you know, we have core inflation. We we take out gas and uh, we take out energy and uh, food prices. And we, we, we're we looking at core inflation. So, well, you may be looking at core inflation, but everyday Americans are not. You, gas gas at the pump and, and food at the supermarket is about like two thirds of most people's budget. It's what they spend other than housing and home heating. Uh, it's what they spend most of their money on. So you can't you can't just pull out the things you don't like and say, well, let's look at the core. Well, mm-hmm. you can look at it, but everyday Americans are not. They're looking at gas prices and eggs and butter and milk and, and, and everything else they buy at the supermarket. So I use headline core because that's what Americans use. And if you want to understand the political aspects of this or how people are going to vote in November or what the Fed should really be worried about, that's the number. And then they came up with something. Uh, they, these are basically people who don't have enough to do. Um, so when, once they got core, you know, they took out food and energy. Oh, don't count that. Then they took out housing and they called it super core. Uh, I'm, I'm not making this up. Sure. This, this is all in the literature. Uh, you can just Google super core. You'll see what I mean. So it's like, oh, OK, I get it. You took out energy, food and housing uh, and to get to what you think is relevant. OK, you you're so detached from everyday Americans. You're so detached from the real uh, what, what what real people are paying for, you know, the things they need that uh, no wonder they get everything else wrong. So um, so I'm talking about headline CPIs, but, but here's my point. Headline CPI was 3% in, uh, so we're in March, uh, 3% in about six months ago. Right now it's 3.2. It's higher than it was six months ago. Now it, it fluctuated in the meantime, it got as high as 3.7. It got down to 3.1, back up to 3.2, et cetera. I'm not saying inflation is going to 20%. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is it's not going to 2%. It's not going to the Fed's target. And it is not mission accomplished. The Fed has not solved the inflation problem, and they're still doing it. So they're nowhere, red, they're nowhere near ready to cut rates, number one. Number two, um, the Fed does not do anything quickly, uh, only in – an emergency, and I mean a, a complete financial meltdown of the kind you know I lived through in 1998 with long-term capital management. Uh, that was we you know we almost took down the world. It came very close, um, but there the Fed had cut rates at a scheduled meeting and then cut them again two weeks later at a, a, an unscheduled meeting. The Fed can have an emergency meeting with a they have an executive committee. They can act between scheduled dates, and they did in that case, and they um, they lower the rates. Again, just to kind of put, and then then the market said, okay, I guess they're serious. Now we will start to normalize. So, um, but that's very unusual. Normally, they uh, not only stick to their schedule, but they want to see three or four months worth of good data, not one month, not one good month. Oh, gee, unemployment went down, inflation went down. Let's cut rates. No, they want that because that could be an anomaly. Sometimes is um, they want to see three or four months in a row. They haven't had that. They haven't had that. It just went up in the most recent month. CPI and PPI, which were just released, uh, you know, in not long, just in the last few days, both went up. Um, now, again, I'm not talking 10 percent. I'm not talking 5 percent. I'm saying wrong direction. And if you're the Fed, there's no way you want to cut rates at this point. So we, we are, I can already tell you what they're going to do in March. They're not going to do anything. OK, what's interesting about that is that Jay Powell at the end, it was either I think it was January 31st was the last meeting. He did something I've never seen him do or any Fed chairman do. He said 
we're not going to raise rates in March. They never do that. They, the, what they say is we're leaning this way, but we were data dependent. We want to see more data. It could go this way, could go that way, but kind of they'll, they'll hint that they're going to fade one way or the other, maybe raise rates. It's the no drama fade. They don't want any shocks. But I was shocked that he said, we're not raising rates in March. Uh, and so, okay, that's, that's an easy one. So then they have meetings in, um, I don't have the calendar in front of me, but I think it's May, uh, maybe May, June, July. Uh, if, if it's not May, it's the end of April. But uh, it, there are three more meetings and then no meeting in August and then a meeting in September. Okay. So based on what I said, that we know they're not going to raise rates in March. They're not going to raise them. I believe June is the next meeting. They're not going to raise them in June. July, maybe, maybe, although the Wall, you know, Wall Street's betting June, but we'll see. Maybe July, but I kind of doubt it. Now, what about September? Well, on November 5th, we have a presidential election. Uh, and everyone says the Fed's not political. That's nonsense. They're one of the most political institutions you'll ever find. They do a very good job of pretending they're not political. They keep politics out of the FOMC statement they keep politics out of the uh press conference they never and they say we're not political they are highly political they look at the same things we're looking at do they uh so the september meeting is a kind of mid mid to late september the election is november 5th you're talking six weeks ahead of the election do you think they want to cut rates six weeks ahead of the election they're in the ultimate no-win situation if inflation gets worse they don't want to raise rates because that'll hurt Biden and favor the Republicans. They don't want to cut rates because that will tend to favor Biden. It'll give Biden a very strong talking point. So they'd kind of like to keep their heads down in September. And then the, 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 the next meeting's not till after the election. Then they'll have a free hand. So could they raise rates in July? Maybe, I'm not sure, but I not in March, not in June, uh, almost certainly not in September for the political reasons I mentioned. Maybe, maybe in July, 125 basis point rate cut, but even then they've got to see the data and they haven't seen it yet. So I'm not ready to, to make that call. But my, my point is that the same pivot crowd who have been wrong for two years might just be wrong again. Um, and so you're like, well, why do they do it? Well, because they want to sell you stocks. I mean, if, if interest <laughs> rates, if interest rates are coming down, people are like, oh, okay. You start, you know, dividends look better and stocks look better and I'll buy some stocks. They um, they have the worst forecasting records. They've been I said that, but they were on for two years. Uh, so what we can tell our viewers with a high degree of certainty: no rate hike in March, no rate hike in June, maybe July, but too soon to say. No meeting in August, and almost certainly not in September because of the election. So so now and now you're down at this point. <laughs> that's maybe one rate hike. Maybe okay. Let's just say one. How are you going to clarify? Get- you're saying hike. You do you mean up? They're going up. So, sorry, I, I misspoke. I down. Yeah, one rate cut. Down. I, so, I okay, yeah. yeah, two years of rate hikes. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, one rate cut. You're right. I misspoke. One rate cut, maybe in July, uh, not in September for political reasons, and then after that, um, you know, I think they have one more meeting before the end of the year. But you know, you're not going to get five cuts. You're not going to get. You'd be lucky to get three, and you might only get two. But it it it's because the it's because the fight against inflation is not over. As I mentioned, inflation actually has been going up a little bit lately. Ah, uh, look, uh, Jim, that was an incredible answer, and you've touched on almost everything I want to talk about today. So thank you for that. One of the things that I really appreciate you saying, and you said it at the start of your answer, is that you emphasise that the Fed is actually reducing their balance sheet, so they're not actually printing money; they're engaging in a form of quantitative tightening. And this is continuing to be missed from a lot of the coverage on the Fed. Um, so thank you for emphasizing the Fed is not printing money. The Fed is reducing their balance sheet and raising rates, which is a form of quantitative tightening. tightening. Well, I'm not talking properly now and I'm a couple of yeah. coffees in, so maybe I'm all jittery. Um, <laughs> so th- thank you for emphasizing that. You also talked about the producer price index. Now, I don't have the annual figure in front of me, but for March, it went up 0.6%. Now that's essentially prices increasing further. You've got, as you said before, you've got uh, inflation running at 3.2% annually in America. I guess my question is, how much of these price hikes are coming from basically, you know, the supply chain destruction we saw over 2020? And how much of it is still a flow on effect from that quantitative easing that was washing through the system in the US for the past three years? 
Right. Great question. I would say none of it is from quantitative easing. By the way, quantitative easing is a kind of money printing, but it is almost completely irrelevant. The Fed, the Fed uh, and the first thing you said, Shay, struck me because I agree completely. You said, um, it's Fed fatigue, Fed, Fed, Fed. I'm tired of hearing about it. Uh, me too. I, I have to follow it because it's what I do. I, I write about it. But so, yeah, we have to pay attention. But the Fed is almost irrelevant, almost completely irrelevant. If you want to know what to look at, say, hey, I want to understand the international monetary system. I want to see if we're possibly heading into recession. Uh, by the way, the UK is in recession now, right now, not forecast now. UK is in recession. Germany's in recession. Japan's in recession. EU is, as a whole is in recession. They're not severe. They haven't been that long, but they are all in recession. Germany, the worst of the lot. Uh, China is slowing down perceptibly, and I'm sure you feel that in Australia because that's your largest export market. China um, is, uh, they've tried everything. They cut rates, monetary ease, uh, stimulus programs, government spending. None of it's working. They're just chugging along, but but slowing down, running out of momentum. And again, that will have an impact on Australia. Uh, we'll come back to the U.S. a little bit because I know you want to talk about US, uh, U.S. GDP. But the point is, if you really want to understand that, you have to look at commercial banks. See, when the Fed prints money, I said it doesn't matter. Here's why. How does the Fed print money? What they do is they call the primary dealers, which are the big banks, you know, Goldman, Wells Fargo, Citi, et cetera, and they buy bonds or notes or treasury bills. So they'll call Goldman say, you know, offer me five-year notes. Goldman will offer them, they'll say, done. Uh, Goldman delivers the notes and then the Fed pays, pays them. When the Fed pays Goldman Sachs in that example, that money comes out of thin air. And that expands M0, which is base money. Call it money printing if you like. Okay, what does Goldman do with the money? They give it back to the Fed in the form of excess reserves. They deposit it with the Fed in the reserve account. And it's excess reserves. And by the way, the Fed pays interest on excess reserves. I we are. They so they pay interest on excess reserves. So if you're Goldman and you're leveraged and you got some money at the Fed, you're making money on it. The money doesn't go anywhere, Shay. It's not lent, it's not spent, it doesn't affect consumers. It's not in the real economy. It's not being used to finance infrastructure or anything else. That money just, the Fed prints it and gives it to the dealer, and the dealer gives it back to the Fed, and that's how they expand their balance sheet. Now, right now, the the opposite is happening, but my point is going back to QE, and I lost count. It was QE. I kept track up to QE4, and then it was QE5, QE6, and then they they did one QE, and they said, don't call it QE. It's like, okay, it's QE7, whatever. But, uh, but none of that money, none of that money made it into the real economy. It was just recycled in the form of banks putting money on deposit at the Fed and the money basically being sterilized. So so where does real money create where does the money creation come from that does affect the economy, that does stimulate the economy? It's from the commercial banks and it's in the euro dollar market. So what you have to ask yourself is <coughs> are the banks expanding their balance sheet? Are the banks lending money? Are the banks accepting various forms of collateral so that people can take leverage positions? Forget the Fed. Look at the banks and look behind the curtain, not even at your Australian or U.S. domestic deposits. Look at the euro dollar market, which is very opaque, very hard to get good data on it. But I can tell you what's going on there. Banks are contracting their balance sheet. In other words, where the real money, this is M1 we're talking about, which are basically bank deposits. Um, that is contracting. Banks are reducing their balance sheet. Uh, they're more and more strict on collateral. Forget mortgages, forget corporates, forget, uh, you know, even double A rated bonds, even 30 year bonds. All they want are treasury bills. They want the best form of collateral, which are treasury bills, one month bills, six month bills, you know, even a year is kind of long for this purpose. So they, they only want the most pristine, super liquid, least volatile type of collateral, which are very short-term treasury bills, <coughs> pardon me, and they're reducing their balance sheet. So the, there is monetary tightening going on, but it's not being led by – well, I mean, the Fed is doing it, but the Fed's not having much of an impact. What is having an impact is the commercial banking system, the euro dollar market. And this explains another phenomenon that people get wrong, which is they look at uh, – Every, uh, I forget if it's monthly or quarterly, I think it's quarterly, but fair, fairly often, the Treasury publishes uh, what they call the TIC report, TIC. And this is a report that shows 
foreign holdings, central bank holdings of U.S. Treasury securities. That's what it shows. And so if you look at China, you'll see a reduction. You'll see that China's holdings of U.S. Treasury securities are going down. So people go, aha, the Chinese, they don't want treasuries. They're dumping their treasuries. They're getting out of treasuries. This is the end of the treasury market. No, it's the exact opposite. China is desperate for dollars. They cannot get dollars from the banks, particularly Japanese banks. So they're selling treasuries, not because they don't want the treasuries. They'd love to have more. They're selling them because they need cash to lend to their own banks to bail out dollar borrowers who can't pay their debts. This is part of a global dollar shortage. And one by one, it's taking various economies into recession. So again, you got to go behind the curtain, say, hey, what's going on backstage in the, in the euro dollar market? And what you see there is monetary contraction, a global dollar shortage. And then people say, well, wait a, second, wait a second, how could there be a dollar shortage? The Fed printed all this money. But I just explained the money the Fed printed went back to the Fed. It didn't go anywhere. The real money in the system is created by the commercial banks in the euro dollar market. They're contracting for their own reasons. Mainly, they're afraid of credit. This goes back to your point about are we heading to stage two of the banking crisis? I think the answer is yes, but but they're very credit conscious. The the time bomb, uh, or maybe landmine is a better word, the landmine this time, are not home mortgages as it was in 2007, because that actually, it's hard to get a mortgage, at least in the United States. They, they've reformed everything. It's like, you know, the, the no doc, low doc, no down payment, no appraisal mortgages, forget it. You need 20% down or more. Uh, you need a, a bona fide appraisal, you know, high, good credit standing. You need a lot income, all verified, et cetera. So it's actually hard to get a mortgage. So that's not the problem. Problem is commercial real estate. Um, and this is uh, a legacy of a couple things. Number one, the whole work from home movement, uh, which everyone said you can't do it. Well, we were forced to do it by governments, at least. I mean, uh, I know Australia, they had concentration camps set up. And I think the U.S. Was, was not. Well, you did. Uh, the U.S. was not much better. No, they took you outside of Melbourne into a camp. Um, but the U.S. was oh, not much better. Yeah, and Canada was not. By the way, I'm not picking on Australia. This was around the world. The U.S. was just as bad. Canada was probably worse in their own way. The freedom truckers, uh, you know, et cetera. I gave them money. I'm surprised they allowed me across the border, but I had a family, yeah. in, I had family in Montreal, so I had a good excuse. Um, but the point being um, that uh, that that work from home thing actually worked. You know, we're, uh, you know, I'm not in Australia, you're not in the United States, but we're, we're doing a face-to-face -face interview. People got used to Zoom. They got used to teleconferencing, et cetera. And a lot of people never went back to the office. And then a lot of employers allowed it. I mean, I, the federal government, all those buildings in Washington, D.C., they're two-thirds empty. Everyone's working from home in Virginia. So that's that's by itself would have killed commercial real estate. But coming out of the pandemic, when interest rates were quite low at the time, there was a building boom. You know, the developer said, hey, interest rates are one percent or you know one and a half percent or two or whatever get me a construction loan let's put up a skyscraper you know etc so you had a building boom at the same time you had a cultural shift that in my view will last for 30 years and i, I said that in my book the new great depression i said the pandemic may be over but the pandemic effects the social changes will last for 30 years as was the case in the great depression when you have a social shock that significant you don't get over it in two years so between work from home and the building boom now there's a glut of commercial real estate and construction loans are not long-term mortgages they're like three-year loans and you have to basically the idea is you get a three-year construction loan then you lease up the building and then you get a long-term mortgage or you get a syndicate of investors and pay off the construction loan and you know live off the rents um but they're at the point where they can't pay off the construction loans because the buildings are not leased up uh, you know, maybe in Dubai, maybe in Dubai, but not in uh, New York. And I doubt uh, it's any different in, in, Mel in Melbourne or Sydney. So we're looking at a commercial real estate collapse. Now, there's a, a game that goes on where the banks, um, they just hold it on, the lenders hold it on their books. If you don't sell it and you don't get it appraised, uh, an accountant will let you keep it on your books at, you know, whatever the cost was, the historic, the historic value. But what happens if one bank gets in distress? They don't want to sell the buildings, but they have to. Or they don't want to sell the mortgages or loans, but they have to because they're in distress. It's a fire sale. 
Well, that's when you see real pricing. That's when you see prices down 40%, 50%. But the impact of that on all the other banks is now the accountants say, hey, that bank across the street, they just took a $5 billion write-off on their commercial real estate portfolio. What about you? You can't tell us that, that all this stuff is worth par. And then, they, then the write-downs begin. And then the distress begins, then the fire sales begin, and then that's when the whole system starts to implode. So we're right on the brink of that. But that will, again, forget home mortgages, that's the last war. This, this new war is commercial real estate. So take everything I just said about commercial real estate and combine it with what we talked about, about the euro dollar market and what, what's considered good collateral and the reduction of derivatives books and bank balance sheets. And you've got a, a very potent... Uh, uh, a cocktail or explosive, if you will, uh, where that's going to basically put us on the edge, if not into a major banking crisis. Oh, do you know, I was about to ask, because around this time last year, we were looking, I think the US had three banks wobble. And I'm just looking at my notes, you know, Silvergate, uh, Silvergate Bank, Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank for the Australians listening. Um, and we've come to the same time this year, so basically 12 months forward, and you're now suggesting that there's actually a much bigger potential commercial uh, commercial property price sort of sleeping in, in the banks. How long does something like that take to play out, especially well, uh, in a rise or a high rate environment? Yeah, well, we must have done that interview uh, between March 12th and March 19th. You're right, it was about a year ago because there were three banks. You're exactly right. It was uh, Silver, Silvergate, Silicon Valley, and Signature. But two weeks later, Credit Suisse failed. It's a shocking Ooh, wedding yes. between Credit Suisse and UBS, one of the biggest, oldest banks in the world. And then, uh, thanks to the Swiss National Bank. And then uh, a few weeks later, actually at the end of April, maybe May 1st, uh, was um, uh, First Republic. And First Republic had $425 billion of uh, uh, um, uh, sorry deposits. But that was just lifted by J.P. Morgan because J.P. Morgan wanted the asset management business. So you actually had five five major bank failures, the three you mentioned, and then two more in the coming weeks. Um, then, but what did the uh, what did the F FDIC and the Treasury do? They guaranteed every bank deposit in the United States because Silicon Valley Bank. Remember that sequence? March twelfth was a uh, sorry, March tenth uh, was a uh, Friday night, and they said. Uh, uh, Silicon Valley Bank has failed. We've taken it over. This is an FDIC press release. Uh, we're only get, we're only insuring deposits up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars. That's the legal limit. That's their insurance policy. Everything over that is uninsured. Uh, your money's gone. We're giving you a receivership certificate of uncertain value. We'll get back to you on what it's worth. Well, the the weekend was practically like barbarians at the gate at the White House. Every Billionaire in Silicon Valley, the crybaby billionaires, every entrepreneur, every startup. Was, oh, you don't understand. That was our working capital. We're going to have to lay people off and discontinue our apps and stop our programs and uh, can't pay the rent and all this stuff. A lot of which was true, but you know, don't put twenty million dollars in one bank. You <laughs> spread it around a little <laughs> bit, or or do some kind of hedging. Um, and by the way, people forget ninety percent of the startups fail anyway. So I'm not sure that. Having them fail under those circumstances was was very different than what would have happened otherwise. But uh, that was enough to panic the Fed and the FDIC. So Sunday night, 48 hours after the Friday night press release, when they said all these deposits just went up in smoke, they said they came out with another press release. They said, just kidding. They're all insured. Oh, and by the way, Cisco had... Um, I think three billion. I want to say three billion dollars. Uh, there was a, a cryptocurrency exchange that had about the same, about three billion dollars. There were a lot of companies that had hundreds of millions of dollars of deposits. The total deposits were about one hundred and forty billion dollars. The Silicon Valley Bank only three percent were insured. So one hundred ninety-seven percent of one hundred and forty billion dollars was ready to go up in smoke on Friday night. By Sunday, they said no. Just kidding. They're all insured. And then the Fed said, oh, by the way, every member bank in the system, now you're talking about trillions of dollars of assets. If you have U.S. government securities, send them to us. We'll give you par value in cash. But the point is they were only worth 70 cents on the dollar because, because interest rates had gone from 1% to 5%. Those five-year notes to 10-year notes on the books of the banks were, had lost 20 to 30% of their value. So here's the Fed 
saying, we'll give you 100% of the value, even though they're only worth, let's say, 80%. I had a used car at the time. I said, would you take my used car for what I paid for it? That would be great. I'll, it's, it's not worth anything. It's 15 years old, had a quarter million miles on it. But, um, but that's what they did. And then I thought at the time, oh, gee, uh, you just guaranteed every deposit in the banking system. And you just said every bond is worth par, no matter how far underwater it is. You're out of tricks. Like you have no more rabbits. Once you, once you guarantee every government bond in the system and every deposit in the system, there are no more rabbits in the hat. Now, it did the trick, which is after First Republic, things calmed down. And then Wall Street's back to, you know, Goldilocks, Pivot, Soft Landing, all this stuff. Um, but my experience was that severe banking panics, uh, I, well, either monetary banking crises or financial crises, they, they can be different, um, happen in two stages with what I call a halftime. So for, I'll give you a couple of real quick examples. In we all remember September 1998, that was the height of the long-term capital management you know, Russia defaulted in August. Long-term capital management was rescued uh, in September. But if it hadn't been rescued, they would have sequentially closed every market in the world. I mean, we saw that happening. But that started in June 1997 in Thailand when they devalued the Thai bot and put on capital controls. And then it spreads your neighborhood, Shay. This is spread to Malaysia, uh, Indonesia. Um, then there was a big blow up at the Hong Kong IMF meeting with George Soros and uh uh, Dr. Mahathir, my, my, my friend, uh, Tun Mahathir, and um, uh, Bob Rubin had to come in and break up the fight. Um, and then it spread to Korea, and there was literally blood in the streets. People were getting killed in riots, money riots in Korea. But then it calmed down. This was all from June to around September, October. But then November, December, January, February, on into early 1998, it was very calm. And everyone said, well, glad that's over. But then beginning in April, then peaking in September, it came back again. Same thing in 2007. I mean, remember um, that started in, I uh, believe it was kind of March of 2007 when HSBC announced that their mortgage losses were higher than expected and earnings were disappointing, et cetera. And Ben Bernanke was quoted on the record saying, no problem, this will blow over. Uh, and then August 2007, Jim Cramer's famous rant on CNBC with uh, Aaron Burnett. They know nothing. They know nothing. He was right, by the way. They they didn't know anything. They never <laughs> did. Um, but then and then it calmed down. That you know, September, Hank Paulson had the super save. We're going to buy up all the credit card receivables from all the banks. It never happened, but just saying it like calmed people down. Uh, and then in December, this is the funniest part. In December 2007, they called up all the sovereign wealth funds. And they they got them to buy nine percent between five and nine percent of all the big banks, so Kuwait, uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, Government Investment Corporation of Singapore, uh, and a few others. They went around and they bought between five and nine percent of Morgan Stanley, Citibank, um, uh, a, a couple other banks, and um, they kept offering Le they kept offering to buy Lehman. South Korea was going to buy Lehman Brothers. The problem with Dick Fold is they kept sending the ambulance and he refused to get in. Uh, he didn't. He didn't understand it was over. They were trying to help him. But um, well, so all the sovereign wealth funds bailed out the U.S. banks in December. So everyone goes, "Okay, that's over." Well, it wasn't over. And now it's going to 2008. So there was a quiet period. March, Bear Stearns fails. June, Freddie May and uh, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae fail. Uh, August, Congress bails out. Uh, Fannie Mae and uh, uh, Fre uh, Fre uh, Freddie Mac. Then September 15th, Lehman Brothers. Then AIG, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs were hanging by a thread. So my point is that started in the spring of 07. It peaked in September, October 08, but there was a quiet period. By the way, they called the sovereign wealth funds again in September uh, 2008, and they said, no thanks, we've had enough fun. Uh, <laughs> we're, not, we're, not, we're not bailing out because all those, all those investments were underwater at that point. Um, so, so the history of crises is that they, they become acute steps are taken, they calm down, everyone thinks it's over and then they come back worse. So I look at March to May, uh, 2023 as stage one. I look at the period since then as the quiet period, as I've described it. And I just gave you two historical examples. Um, 
So we're ready for stage two and it started. There's something called NYCB, uh, New York Community Bank. Um, it's a... Uh, uh, it's got a hundred billion of assets. So it's in that middle tier. It's not a too big to fail giant. Uh, but they announced a, a couple of months ago, a $2 billion write-off in commercial real estate, which we were just talking about. Uh, then their stock cratered. Uh, there was a run on the bank. It was hanging by a thread. And then Steve Mnuchin, former treasury secretary of the U S put a syndicate together and he put, he raised a billion dollars of cash and they took over the bank. Now they fired management, put in their own people, took over the board of directors. The stockholders effectively got wiped out because they were diluted by the billion dollars of new money. So it was a it was a bail. It was private sector. It wasn't the government. But that bank effectively failed and was rescued by a private syndicate with one billion dollars in new cash. That's a small, obviously not small, but um, small to medium sized. Uh, lender on Long Island, you know, 30 miles outside of New York City. That's the canary in the coal mine. Combine that with what I was describing about commercial real estate, monetary tightening, and what we see are the ingredients for a series of bank runs, except what, again, going back to what I said earlier, what's the Fed going to do now? They've they've already taken all the government securities and the FDIC has guaranteed all the deposits. How are you going to stop the run? I, I've got to admit, I would love to see uh, what rabbit. You, I know you said they're out of rabbits. Maybe they're not pulling rabbits. Maybe they're pulling out raccoons or something out of their hat this time around. Uh, now, Jim, we are going to rapidly run out of time. So I've got a couple more questions for you before I want to let you go. Uh, I think sitting from Australia, you know, obviously American politics are curious to us because it just – it goes for so long. Like we have a six-week election campaign and done and dusted. Uh, but with Americans, you know, you've got this pre-selection, um, you whittle down your candidates rather than voting for a party like happens here. So we're um, basically watching it with interest. But also, too, obviously what happens in American politics very much impacts Australia, especially because, sure. you know, you're our allies. You're our big brother in the fight. So we rely right. on you guys. You're buying our submarines, so we, we like that even better. <laughs> Yes, that's a whole, I'd love to have that conversation, but we might run out of time today. Uh, let's talk about another Trump-Biden showdown. Now, this is really the third time it's happened. We've got 2015, or the 2016 election, then the 2020 election, and now coming up to 2024, here it goes again. Trump versus Biden. Now, a little bit, part of me is a little bit frustrated that you can't find a candidate there who's under 70. I don't right. understand how America can't put one of those up. But tell me... How do you see this election playing out? And I just want to throw in one anecdote that I read that I find interesting, and this was from an Australian anti-Trump supporter who said perhaps one of the benefits of Trump's winning this election again is that other countries will stop playing up because they're a little bit scared of what he may or may not do. So tell me, let's put your geopolitical hat on. How do you see this election playing out this year? Well, uh, a couple of things. Number one, uh, the scare, and I, I hear what you're saying, and you're absolutely right. I, I see those comments similar to that uh, all along. But, um, you know, anyone can have their own narrative or their own spin, but there's something called reality, um, and it's worth checking in every now and then. Trump was the first president since, oh, uh, I don't know, maybe, uh, I'm not sure how far back you have to go, uh, maybe Gerald Ford who didn't start a war. He, he, there were no wars. The Ukraine war was under uh, Biden. Uh, Obama, you know, we burned down Libya. You know, Gaddafi got a bullet in the eye and worse, so I'll leave out the details. Uh, you know, under George Bush, Saddam was hanged by the neck. Uh, we invaded Iraq in 2003. I love those people. Russia goes into uh, Ukraine. You're violating sovereign territory. What do you think the U.S. did in 2003? I mean, I'm not... Russia-Ukraine discussion, that's a, that's another two-hour interview. But yeah, my, point is, my point is the U.S., so when we invade people, it's okay. But if somebody else does, uh, you're violating international law, et cetera. But, and uh, Bill Clinton bombed Serbia. Um, and uh, George H.W. Bush, I believe we invaded Panama. Uh, and and so on. And so, uh, uh, oh, in Reagan, we had the Contras, uh, you know, and, you know and, so, and you just keep going back. So Trump was the only president who did not start a war. So I, all the stuff about he's scary, he's dangerous. I look at their track record. He's the, he, who, he's the guy who flew to the demilitarized zone 
and met with uh, Kim Jong Un. Now, whatever you think of Kim Jong Un, and you know, Trump's a publicity hound. I'll grant that he's a showman, but uh, he did it, and he they shook hands and they had a, a long meeting. So um, Trump had a good dialogue with Putin. I mean, I can't think of a better natural alliance in the United States and Russia, uh, you know, versus China, which is the main enemy. But somehow, uh, U.S. policy elites who don't know anything, uh, they're worse than economists when it comes to that, have singled out Russia as the main enemy. Russia is not the main enemy. Russia and the United States would, would be very good natural allies vis-a-vis -vis China. You know, uh, Shay, I'm going to guess that you're a pretty good poker player. Uh, so uh, just a guess. But there's an old saying in poker, if you're in a three-handed game and you don't know who the sucker is, you're the sucker. <laughs> yes. It's always, no, it's always two, it's always two against one. Two players, you know, can bind forces to clean out the other guy. And then they turn on each other. Well, we have a three-handed poker game. There are only three countries that really matter in the world, China, Russia, and the United States. Uh, we've got lots of allies, lots of important economies. I love Australia. Can't wait to get back. But it's really Russia, China, and the United States. It's a three-handed poker game. But right now, the U.S. is the sucker. It's Russia and China versus the United States. And people like Kissinger, which means we lose. People like Kissinger understood. See, what Kissinger and Nixon did, they cozied up to China to isolate the Soviet Union. And it worked. Soviet Union collapsed. Communism's gone. Here comes Putin, et cetera. But now it's time for the U.S. and Russia to join hands to isolate China. That's how you win the game. But the U.S. foreign policy elites, um, they, uh, I've never seen a sorry or a bunch. I, mean, I, I, I look back, I mean, in addition to having lived through a lot of this, I'm a, uh, I, 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 a graduate degree in international relations. I was American foreign policy major. I look at, you know, Dean Acheson, John Foster Dulles, Dean Rusk, James Baker, Henry Kissinger, George Schultz. Where are they? Where, where are the giants of, uh, we can go back even further, where are the giants of American foreign policy? We got Jake Sullivan, who's basically a, a campaign manager, a political hack. We got uh, Tony Blinken, who's a, a lightweight. Uh, Cookies Newland just left. They, they called her Cookies Newland because she was, a, she was the primary sponsor of the war in Ukraine and led the 2014 coup where we, MI6 and CIA, overthrew a duly elected leader of Ukraine. Yes, he was pro-Russian. I'll allow for some corruption, but he was elected in a fair election, and the U.S. overthrew him with the neo-Nazi snipers in Maidan Square shooting innocent civilians, and Victoria Newland's going out in the daylight handing out cookies and sandwiches to the protesters. You know, um, but as a cynical, ruthless, you know, I mean, Trump got Trump got impeached for a phone call to Zelensky. I mean, you know, the warmongers today, Biden, uh, Lindsey Graham, uh, Mitch McConnell, uh, all of them, they're flying to Kiev, they're hugging. Uh, Zelensky, I don't know if he ever changes his T-shirt. I mean, hopefully for their sake. But, um, but, but, but Trump, who never went to Kiev, got in, impeached for a phone call, all because he put some reservations around further aid, consistent with what I was saying before. So here we are in a, a major war in Ukraine, um, losing badly. Uh, that's the other thing you won't get from. Well, certainly, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Financial Times, uh, the Economists are basically all lies. If you want um, good information, you need to develop your sources, read some of the um, Italian and German newspapers. Uh, Russian sources are actually pretty reliable, uh, but there are they're independent comment, commentators out there. You have to find them. You can. Um, and uh, But, but uh, Ukraine is losing badly. They'll be out of ammunition by the end of June. Um, we're, the reason we're sending cluster bombs is because, which mainly kill children, uh, it's because we're out of 155 millimeter shells. The thing is that the, the Newland warmonger Tony Blinken take on Ukraine was we're going to we're going to poke a stick in the right and keep poking until they invade. So, yeah, Russia invaded, but we uh, uh, provoked them for, for 14 years from starting in 2008 when Bush said Ukraine and Georgia should join NATO. And then four months later. Putin invaded Georgia. Like there's a there's a little clue there. And then in 2014 they did the coup and Putin invaded Crimea. So it's like how many invasions do you need before you take the man seriously? But we kept poking and poking and poking. Putin doesn't bluff, by the way. I said you have to understand Jay Powell to understand the Fed. You have to understand Putin. He does not bluff. And so if he says I'm going to do it, he does it. 
So anyway, we're losing that word badly. Uh, but so I don't get the Trump paranoia thing. I'd be far more concerned about Biden, who's been wrong about everything for 40 years. So now there's no more dangerous occupation than predicting politics. Everyone who does it, and I do it, <laughs> um, will tell you, you know, that there's a cliche. I don't like cliches, but some of them are true. Uh, a week is a lifetime in politics. And that's true. You know, this we're going to get a ruling in this Georgia Rico case against Trump probably tomorrow. Uh, that could turn things upside down. But we do have a lot of information. And if you said, well, OK, Jim, based on what we know today, allowing for the fact that there's a lot of uncertainty between now and November, based on what you know today, uh, what's going to happen? Trump is going to win in a landslide. It's, it's not close. There are we have 50 states in the United States. There are only seven of them that matter. You know, Biden's going to win California no matter what. Biden's going to win New York no matter what. Trump's going to win Alabama no matter what. There's, so there's a whole bunch of states where we know what's going to happen. There are only seven where it, eh, there are the swing states, the battleground states. They are going to decide the election. Um, oh, it says Nevada, Arizona, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin. Uh, who did I leave out? Uh, left out uh, one or two, but they're, they're, those states um, are going to decide the election. Trump's ahead in every one, with one exception, which is Pennsylvania, where the difference is one tenth of one percent, not one percent, one tenth of one percent, which is well within the margin of error. But Trump's ahead between two and seven points in six of the seven battleground states. That's an electoral college landslide. You know, we don't. Do a pop. We have a popular vote, but it's for the purpose of awarding electors state by state. And so you win by getting 270 electors, so called. Uh, Trump looks to me like he'll get 320, 330. That's a, that's a landslide, number one. And he's ahead in the national polls, which actually don't matter because that's not how we do it. But just for the record, he's ahead in the national polls. He's ahead in the betting odds. And then there's a view. In the United States, well, obviously Bush is senile. He's cognitively impaired, physically impaired, unfit to be president. That's all very apparent. So the view is, well, let's get the primary season over, um, which it kind of is because they all, Trump and Biden both have enough delegates so far to get the nomination. So that's over. There are more primary elections. They won't matter, but there are more until June. Uh, the conventions are in July and August. So sometime around late June, you take Biden aside and say, hey, sorry, buddy, it's over. You got to stand down. We're going to bring in, and there are ways to do this. It's not impossible. Bring in Gavin Newsom or, you know, everyone's favorite, Michelle Obama, uh, Gretchen Whitmer, Governor of Michigan, uh, Jennifer Graham, Secretary of Energy, Gina Raimondo, Secretary of Commerce. It's, uh, they're all on the, on the short list. I saw the most fascinating poll the other day. They said, okay. What about a head-on-head -head contest between Trump and Newsom and Trump and Michelle Obama? In that poll, he beats Newsom by 14 points, and he beats Michelle by seven points. And I, that surprised a lot of people. It didn't surprise me because she, she would be almost the worst candidate you could think of. Uh, we don't have to get into the reasons. But, um, uh, but the, my point is the rescue, the rescue puppies, the, the two, Newsom and Michelle, who are at the top of the short list of people who in theory could beat Trump actually are run further behind than Biden. Biden is not only physically and mentally impaired, he's their strongest candidate. So if, if you want to figure it out right now, uh, go with Trump, but that's not, that's not just an opinion. My, my, I have opinions. My opinions don't matter. I try to stick to data and I just gave you a lot of data, but it all points to, a convincing victory for Trump. Uh, look, obviously, I will be watching this with keen interest, and so will many Australians. Now, moving forward, uh, I'm rapidly running out of uh, time with you today, Jim. This has been a fantastic conversation. Also, too, we haven't talked many commodities, but that's okay. We did absolutely need to talk about economics uh, because what happens in economics very much shapes what happens in commodities. But right. we cannot leave today's conversation without my favourite question of the entire podcast, and that is, cocktails. Now, you and I have shared many a beverage together over the years. Right. There's been cocktails, there's been beers, there's been some Australian traditions. Tell me, when I next see you again, which will probably likely be Boca Raton this year coming up in the next couple of months, right. what cocktail can I buy you at the bar? 
Oh, uh, well, thank you. I, um, I, I like, uh, well, my favorite, like kind of standby is a uh, rum and tonic, Mount Gay rum and tonic with lime, but I've really, uh, I'm single-handedly bringing back the, the classic daiquiri. Um, but I find that I have to teach waitresses and waiters and bartenders how to make them. Uh, I was in a bar once, uh, and I ordered a daiquiri and they said, well, we're, so- we're sorry, we don't have a blender. And I said, that's fine because you don't need one. There's no yes. blender. They, they, they immediately think of a strawberry daiquiri or a banana daiquiri, something where you throw in ice and fruit and, you know, some rum and all that and blend it all up and serve it in a tall glass with an umbrella and a big straw. That that's dessert if you want it. That's not a daiquiri. <laughs> a, a daiquiri is um, is just rum, rum and lime juice, just a spot of simple sugar, shaken, not stirred, uh, no blender required, and served in a martini glass, uh, straight up, not on the rocks. That's a daiquiri. Uh, but if you want to buy me uh, one of those, I'll be I'll look forward to it. I will absolutely see if I can get you one of those. Also, too, I just want to point out that daiquiris in the 80s became that whole frozen mushy thing, didn't they? Right. That's yes. what I was taught a daiquiri was, and I never got into them. But I can get into rum, lime juice, and a bit of sugar. That sounds amazing. <laughs> By the way, the best, <laughs> the, uh, the best daiquiri in the world, I, I had them in a few places, put it that way, uh, the American Bar and the Savoy Hotel in London. Ooh, Okay. The American Bar Savoy Hotel London. Walk, okay. in the lobby, walk in the lobby. It's a European style lobby to the left, up a flight of steps. You're walking into history. Everyone from, uh, you know, Churchill, a long line of British prime ministers, British royalty, uh, celebrities, you know, from Elton John on down, Americans, diplomats. It's the place. And particularly if you're an American, you're meeting a, a Brit friend or a friend from anywhere in the world. It's a, it's a great place to go. A nice piano player. And the best daiquiri in the world. All right. Mentally banked that I must get to that bar (laughs) when in London. Uh, Jim, this has been a fascinating conversation today. Thank you so much for your time. uh, And I can't wait to see you again in person. Thanks, Jay. Well, now you know how to make a classic daiquiri, but also too, now you're informed of what's happening in the US and perhaps why the Fed probably isn't going to cut rates anywhere near as drastically as some of these headlines have been telling us. Make sure you keep that in mind as you go about making investment decisions that essentially Wall Street's telling a different narrative to what's more likely going to play out. That's all for this episode of Cocktails and Commodities. Make sure you're following so you never miss out on what stocks are making news, which commodities are moving markets, and the companies trying to get it out of the ground. 